And today we're joined by Victoria Calvin of Victoria Marie Designs, who's here at scrapbook.com and filming a few new series with us. And we are excited to have you here. All right. So for those of you who might not know who Victoria is, she was actually born in Germany, moved around the U.S., but now resides in Texas. She has worked for the court-appointed Special Advocates Program, but was looking for a way to pursue her crafting passion. Victoria became active in the community and shared layouts online and started making YouTube videos in 2014. In 2016, Victoria Marie Designs was born and uh, now she teaches scrapbooking classes and that has actually become her full-time job. I know, dream job, right? She has over 10 classes and a very popular growing YouTube channel. And she has also taught a lesson in our Cards for Kindness series and is here filming a few other series that you don't want to miss coming up later this year. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, so I want to kick things off. And first, we want to know, what was your very first experience crafting? I have been a crafter for pretty much all my entire life. And I remember as a kid, I would, I would make a variety of different things. I was always getting into something. My mom was a cross-stitcher, or she still is sort of. And so yeah. I would get into all of her sewing threads. Like, she did not like that, but I did. And I would make all kinds of things like friendship bracelets. And um, I made a scrapbook at the time, which I didn't know was a scrapbook, but I had a collection of all my awards that I was receiving in school. I was, you know, principal's honor roll and all that good stuff nice. <laughs> back in the day in my class photos and all those things. And I took an old binder that my mom got from her job and I covered it with the funny pages from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And that was my, uh, you know, embellishing my album. And I didn't know no. It was like a pro, you know, mm -hmm. foretelling uh -huh. of things to come. And um, and I put all my little awards and things in there, all my ribbons and my photos and whatnot. And that kind of became my first little scrapbook. And from there, I've just dabbled in a bunch of things. I kind of consider myself an eclectic scrapbooker. And then I found my way to scrapbooking probably around junior high or high school, um, just picking up things from, you know, the local craft store and putting some stuff together, but wasn't really super committed to it, just playing around with a bunch of other things that I liked. And then it wasn't until um, I got married and became a mom that I really started getting, a lot of us, that's our entry, right? Yes, the <laughs> I really started getting into scrapbooking the way that I, you know, scrapbook today. Right. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Do you still have... Um, the original scrapbook that has the funny pages on it. Is it faded? What does I it look do. like? So the newspaper has held up pretty well over really? time. And it's been over 30, 30 wow. years. And it sits, it doesn't even sit in like a safe box. It's in a, just a regular cardboard box that I have in my garage that I really need to bring inside the house. But anytime that I open that box, it's still there and it still looks great. And the photos still look great. And all the other paper that's in it that still looks great. None of it's archival, but it still looks fantastic. Aww. So I need to bring it in. I, I plan on, I, I probably need to get it out of that and put it in something archival. So maybe that's a project for the summer. Okay, yes. good. Yeah. And maybe snap a photo because I'd love to see yes, it. Yes. With the old faded uh, funny pages, funny pages. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, avid today scrapbooker. What are your go-to products right now? I would say, uh, bottom line, I always have to have really good adhesive, mm -hmm. regardless. Always good adhesive. Pattern paper, for sure. Um, simple embellishments. My favorites are die cuts. Anything that's textured with like uh, like a uh, chipboard die okay. cuts are my absolute favorite, bar none. Um, and then, of course, always, always good photos. Of always. course. Yeah. Of course. Awesome. So you have had a an eclectic life thus far and, you know, will continue to do so. Um, I was reading your notes and back when you were in graduate school, you had a thesis advisor that gave you some sage advice mm -hmm. and you still carry this through your life today. Can you share that story with us? Absolutely. So I was, I was probably in graduate school a little bit longer than what I should have been. So I was going into my third year of graduate school. I had become a new mom in the midst of all of this. I was, was uh, working on a master's degree in human development, which I did finish and graduate. And I kept prolonging my graduate thesis and I couldn't just nail down the topic. Well, I kind of knew, I knew what the topic was going to be. It was just the actual 
process of writing the thesis. And so finally, I went to my graduate advisor and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to need another semester. She goes, you don't need another semester, Victoria. You are graduating this semester. (laughs) I will make you. I will make you graduate this semester. And she says, all you need to do is just start. Open up a Word document and just start writing words and we'll work everything else out. Because in my mind, I was already at point Z. I was thinking about the end product, the thesis that I would then have to present to my committee. And um, she's like, you just need to write something down. She says, anytime that I'm working on a research project or anything like that, I just open up a a document and I start outlining what it is that I want to write and I go from there. And so I took that advice. I eventually finished my thesis, which was about non-traditional students in, in college. So people who are parents and that type of thing. And that's solidly where I was in graduate school being married with a new baby. And my spouse at the time was also in graduate school. And so I uh, ended up finishing the thesis and I graduated and I defended it and passed and was good to go. And I carried that with me throughout my career. Um, at one point, many moons ago, I was an HR manager. And so there's uh, things that I had to do in that career that required writing and getting ideas down. And then flash forward in my career in nonprofit, same thing. And I still utilize that same advice as an entrepreneur because there's sometimes I'll sit and look at that blank page when I'm trying to develop a class mm-hmm. or or an idea. And I just remind myself that Dr. Jacobson said to get the words out on paper, outline it and go from there. So I carry that around. And I teach my daughter that too, as a homeschool parent, I teach her that same technique as well. Just start. Just start. Yeah. Yeah, And it is, it is very true. And I think it's going to be great to talk about just starting today because A, if you're already a scrapbooker, maybe you're kind of frozen or not feeling inspired. So just starting the next layout or starting the next card and, or, Um, If you're new, 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 and you're like, I want to do this. I'm lurking. I'm watching. I haven't started. So, you know, someone listening, this might be their just start moment when it comes to scrapbooking. So let's dive into that and pick your brain because you've been doing it for 15, 16, 17 years. Let's talk to that just start person. Sure. So how did you, uh, so first, what sizes or what kinds of paper crafting do you do? Like in what forms and sizes? Mainly scrapbooking. That's my jam all the way. And then also card making. Um, I do make mini albums as well. And then there's occasionally some DIY 3D type stuff that I may dabble with, but but card making, scrapbooking, mini albums definitely is my jam. Okay. And how do you choose or how do you begin creating different size layouts? Do they speak to you? How do you choose? How do you know what size you're going to make? You know, I wish I had a succinct technical (laughs) answer for that, but really it just depends on how I feel. Most of my projects are 12 by 12 layouts because that's just kind of my, my wheelhouse in a lot of ways. But as I was learning more about scrapbooking and different forms of scrapbooking over the years, I started becoming more drawn to things like pocket scrapbooking, which is great when I just want to do like everyday stories. So it's a story that maybe doesn't require me making a full page, but I just want a few little things, you know, down somewhere in a decorative manner that I can remember. So typically if it's pocket scrapbooking, it's going to be everyday stories. Mm -hmm. If it's 12 by 12 layouts, it's going to be something a little bit more deeper or I have more photos or simply sometimes I just want to play with product (laughs) because, you know, that's just what I want to do. The room. I want the room to do it. Um, For a long time, I did two page layouts. I don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, mainly because it's just not something that interests me, but I'll do one when I need to. Like if I'm working on a contract project and that's required of me, I'll do one. But for personal purposes, I don't. Um, Sometimes I do eight and a half by 11. And if I do eight and a half by 11, then I'm usually scrapbooking photos that I've scaled down to be smaller so then I can get more on the page. Or it's usually very focused stories, like focused stories about myself because I do scrapbook a, a lot about myself. And sometimes those stories end up on eight and a half by 11 spreads. So I don't have a solid rhyme or reason. It just really depends on how I feel. Okay. Okay, good. And you mentioned uh, your go-to products, if you will, are photos. Yeah. So photos we know are a huge part of traditional scrapbooking Mm -hmm. and modern day scrapbooking. Sometimes people need that nudge to print their photos. Uh, You have strong opinions about this. (laughs) Why do you feel that that's important to print our photos? Mainly because, and, I'll, and I've learned this over the years, not only from personal experience, but also because we just simply need to print them. The, the digital media will only exist for as long as it exists. When you save your photo to, say, Google Photos, or if you're using iCloud or a number of others, and you don't own 
that product, it's not proprietary to you, they can eventually just go away. And so can any of the data that you stored on those platforms. And so when you have a print photo, it's yours. No one can take that away from you unless someone physically takes it away from you. And barring there's no natural disaster or house for any house fire or anything like that, your photos are relatively going to stay pretty much intact if you have them stored in an archival safe box or in a photo album. But it's one thing to have them stored digitally, which you should as a backup, but you also need to print them as well because there's no guarantees that that digital medium is going to be available to you 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Technology comes and goes. And so having print copies of your photos becomes essential. And also too, um, it's easier to look at your things, at your photos when they're printed versus pulling up thousands upon thousands of photos Agreed. on a phone or on a computer. So I am a big advocate for printing your photos, right. definitely. And I know just from my experience, looking through the phone or device, that can almost be overwhelming. And then you then don't mm-hmm. start. But yes. if you're one moment away from holding the photo to scrapbooking, absolutely, you're start. Absolutely, yeah. So uh, to our listeners, if you've listened, we have had Shari Pack of Persnickety Prints on here. And I think you feel the very same way as her mm-hmm. that, you know, she feels the same way. Get them printed, yeah, you know. Yeah. She's like, she is preaching from the mountaintop uh, all the time in her Instagram videos and whatnot, telling people to print your photos. And, you know, and I think not only because she owns a print company, clearly she wants you to you know print your photos, but she makes such really good points about, you know, the, the technology piece of it, the having a physical photo, the embracing those memories And so it's good to hear that there are other people that are championing, you know, printing your photos for sure. Okay, so the person, they have the supplies, they have the paper, they've got their photos printed, they have their adhesive. What's next? What do you tell them? So you have all the materials. Now you just simply start. And usually what I tell people is there's really no right or wrong where you start. Just start where you feel naturally drawn to. So for me, for many years, I always start with the background if I'm constructing a layout. So I get my papers. I lay out something really nice and simple, a nice space. Then I put my photo down. Mm -hmm. And then I add a few little embellishments. Then I may add a title and some journaling. And then if I feel that I need to add anything else, then I will. And I've sort of developed sort of this creative process or this flow as I am putting together a layout. Sometimes it just comes together real nice and organically, and sometimes it doesn't. But my main advice is you just have to start putting something down on the page. And here's the thing, it doesn't have to be permanently there on the page. So if you don't like where you put something, just remove it and put it in a different position. Or if you don't like a particular die cut or whatnot that you put down, it's okay. Just take it off and put something else on. I think what happens is people get creative paralysis. Mm. And it's very easy because, you know, we have this great thing called the internet, right? So yeah. you can go to YouTube and you can look at blogs and go to, well, who's looking at blogs and say, hello, 90s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're looking at the blogs for those of us who have blogs. Um, but you can go to Instagram. You can go to all these different places and get tons of creative inspiration. And when you're new, and I definitely experienced this as a new scrapbooker, is feeling as though my layouts had to look like the person's yes. in the magazines or in the whatever it was. I was looking at a lot of magazines at that mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And so my very first sort of official layout took me two weeks to complete. And so I've learned over the years to just start. Even now as a professional designer, I sometimes will have to sit and look at a project and say, okay, Victoria, get out of your way, own way, and just start. Mm-hmm. So for those of you who are new, get all your supplies together, take a deep breath, grab a drink and a snack, relax. Yeah. And lean into the creative process and just put the materials down and have some fun playing and moving things around until you get into a composition that you feel works well for your layout. Nice. And you're describing it dry. Like you're saying you lay them all down dry without any adhesive. You start sure, moving and absolutely. piecing. And then eventually, and I usually, I will te- I say this a lot in my live streams. I'll say, you know, let's just go ahead and add some adhesive and commit. Because at some, point, <laughs> at some point, you need to commit to this, right? Stick it down. So move the things around, but don't move them around to inertia. Just make some decisions, add the adhesive, put them on your page. And, and move it right. along. Yeah. Absolutely. A little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. Just put it down. Yes. Just put it down. And okay. what happens when you first start, I want to point this out real quickly. When you when you first start moving things around and getting things done, what you're doing is you're exercising your creative muscle. You're kind of getting that initial, you know, creative energy out. And I always say my first layout always is my worst worst layout. It's not always my favorite layout. One. So get that one done and then you move on to the rest of them and they'll be beautiful. I love that. <laughs> it is It is true. Kind of yeah. like the first pancake. Yes. The first one's always just kind of little janky little pancake. Yeah. You know, it's not perfectly round. It might be a little burnt mm-hmm. and then you make, you know, 10 more and they're perfect. Yeah, it's seasoned. <laughs> exactly. It's, 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 it's good. Yeah. 
So another question then, people have all that. Um, they they might not know what to document, especially if they're in different phases of their life. Mm-hmm. What, what advice do you have for someone that's like, I don't know what to document? Sure. I always say go to what is the most important thing that if you were to not scrapbook ever again, what would be like, say, the top 10 stories or remembrances or experiences you would want to remember and maybe okay. start there? For some people, they're driven more by events. So if that's what you want to scrapbook, scrapbook events, scrapbook holidays, start there. If you're more drawn to um, everyday stories, mm-hmm. start with that. Start with maybe something you experienced recently or maybe just your everyday flow or your mm-hmm. schedule or maybe something about work or mm-hmm. or whatnot. Um, I always say start with where you feel naturally drawn to what story you feel naturally drawn to, to tell. So when I first started really getting into scrapbooking, I told a lot of stories about myself and my okay. own viewpoint and my own experiences. Mm-hmm. I've never really had a problem scrapbooking about myself. Some people do. Some mm-hmm. people feel very awkward about mm-hmm. doing that. Um, and then when I had a kid, then of course a lot of my scrapbooking became about her because she's my muse. Yeah. Um, and still is today. But start where it feels natural for you. And if that means you're scrapbooking for a little bit, a bunch of events and experiences, start there. And then maybe once you kind of get into that flow, you start thinking about other stories mm-hmm. that you could tell, thinking about your everyday, thinking about events that are happening in the world or transitions in your life. If you are a lot, a lot of folks in my community, and I hear this just in general in scrapbooking, for those who are empty nesters, yeah. right, who are used to scrapbooking a lot about kids and that type of thing. Well, now kids are flying the coop. Or even if you're single, mm-hmm. um, you have a life. Yes. <laughs> you have stories to tell. Yes. So think about if you were to, if you were never to scrapbook again, what would be those 10 stories you would want to document? I love that. And it could be about anything and just start there. That's wonderful. And another thing that people get frozen with is the photos or what kind of photos or where to put the photos and do I need photos? So what 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 do you have to say about that? I always say when people who ask, do you need photos? Then I, I always feel that then you're, you know, what's a scrapbook page without a photo? Now, you don't always need to put a photo. Like I've made some scrapbook pages where it's just like, maybe it's a quote or a song lyrics, or I didn't have a photo for a right. particular story. And maybe I didn't want to use like a stock photo. Mm-hmm. I've done that too. Okay. Um, so sometimes you can, you know, definitely do that. Um, but pick out a photo that I, th- I would say pick out photos that best represent the story you want to tell. And it doesn't have to be the best photo in the world because I have scrapbooks and blurry photos because that may be the only photo I oh, have. Oh, yeah. And so I would rather have the blurry photo than no photo. Okay. So I usually will sift through the thousands of photos that I take mm-hmm. and pick out as I'm going through and I'm deleting and purging photos, I will keep two or three that I feel best represent what it is that I'm trying to document. Um, it may be a little bit more if it's vacation photos. Yes. Um, like I have an upcoming Disney World <laughs> vacation, so there's going to be a lot of the photos there. Oh, yeah. But my first Disney World trip, I'm not even going to tell you how many photos I have okay. of that. Okay. But it's a lot. But, <laughs> <laughs> but point being is to pick out two or three photos that you feel best represent that and start and start okay. from there. I think a lot of folks, particularly new scrapbookers, feel... Um, called to scrapbook all the photos. Yes, I've heard that. Yes. And so physically on a scrapbook page, you can't put all the photos no. on a scrapbook page. So pick out a few that you feel best represent what it is that you're trying to say. Maybe a few, depending on what the theme or the subject of the layout mm-hmm. is. If it's people heavy, pick out a few that best represent those individuals, yeah. whoever it is that you're telling the story about. If it's, um, say you have some hiking pictures, mm-hmm. pick out a few of those landscape photos that best represent that story and let that go in your scrapbook. Because here's the thing. Those extra photos, you can always put in a photo album. Exactly. Yeah, they don't have to go on a layout. Yeah. And, yeah, there's the scrapbook. And then there's just the regular photos to sift through later. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it took me a while to learn that because I was one of those who tried to scrapbook all the photos and quickly learned there's only so much you can get on a scrapbook page. Um, Pocket scrapbooking is fantastic for that, by the way, because you slip it in. (laughs) Little extras in there. And there's different uh, stylistic techniques that we can do to add more photos to a project. But I eventually took the pressure off myself and said, you know what? I just need these little, these two or three to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And then I focus more on the words for that project versus the photos so much. And then the rest of the photos go either in cold storage or they go in an album. Okay. Yeah. So when you talk about words... What do you think about journaling? Does every layout need journaling? What is journaling to you? Sure. My, I always ask if someone were to to look at your scrapbook Mm -hmm. and they were looking at the photos and there were no words there, what do we want them to convey from that page? I, my mother had kept photo albums for years and she would write maybe small descriptions or none at Mm -hmm. all. 
And so we were recently going through some albums, and this woman has no trouble throwing photos out or oh. or, or whatnot. Okay. Yeah. So she, well, cutting people out that she doesn't oh, like out of her oh. photos. Yeah. So we got oh, some wow. of those in the photo albums. Okay. Too. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. And I think at one year she broke up with a, a boyfriend she was dating and she burned some photos. Oh, okay. And our barbecue it's grill cathartic. would like, yeah, mm-hmm. it was cathartic. Mm-hmm. It was her, you know, her cookies, yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. So I would, I don't think I'd ever burn photos, but she was like, whatever. So she's throwing Stop. all photos away. So, um, <laughs> Wait, no, I forgot the question. <laughs> so I'm talking about my mom burning her photos. <laughs> so the uh, journal, what does your mom think about journaling? Journaling, she, thank she you. Write, like, Let's bring Jimmy it back to the point. Whatever. Let's bring it back to point. Yeah. <laughs> so she would have these little, like she would put people's names or stuff and then sometimes there would be nothing. So I'm looking through these photo albums and I'm thinking to myself, who are these people? Yeah. And I would ask her, she's like, I don't know who they are. Mm-hmm. It's like she's 70 something now. So it's yeah. like, she has no clue who these people are. And I'm thinking it would have been helpful, particularly if it was relatives, that we kn- knew who these people were in these pictures because once she's gone, I inherit all these albums and I don't have the heart to let them go because, hello, I'm a scrapbooker. Of course, you I'm going to keep know. them. But I don't know who these people are. Yeah. And so, and I don't have a lot of our, a lot of our elder relatives have passed on. So I can't go to them. And then even my uncles and things, they don't know. Nobody mm-hmm. remembers. And so I always say, put something there, even if it's just a small little detail, if at minimum, put who's in the photo mm-hmm. or what the location is. But a scrapbook page without journaling is simply just a fancy page with photos mm-hmm, on it, right? Mm-hmm. And so put something down. And as you are getting more comfortable with journaling, you can think of different ways that you can approach the story. Whether you are just stating the facts, mm-hmm. it can be a list, different bullet points, bullet points of things. And I've done that a lot when I don't want to write long prose yeah. on a layout. Sometimes the story is deep where I do need to sit down and kind of pre-write it. And I want to go in detail in that story. So maybe it is a longer journaling experience. It's a little bit, it not maybe not lengthy, because you can still get your point across without having a lengthy amount of journaling on a layout. But I always make sure that I have something on that layout. So down the road, when I'm looking at this and I can remember what's happening, mm-hmm. my daughter, I only have one kid, so she's going to get all the scrapbooks. Yay! Uh, yay! <laughs> so she will know what's in the, what those stories are, because mm-hmm. the stories, I think, are the meat are of what we do. And so if you're going to put a beautiful photo down there, have some words with it, even if it's just little details. Yeah, you, you paint a very real, very slightly scary uh, experience there mm-hmm. or, or story because you're not talking about a great, great grandma's album. You're mm-hmm. talking about one generation away from yourself. Absolutely. And you don't know who... Jimmy is or yes. uncle, whoever. Like yes. it's yeah. So write some dates, write some names, write some bullet points. Something. Okay. Yeah. So do you think that you creating needs to be chronological once you start? <laughs> no. And I know all the chronological people out there are like a collective gasp. I can hear it. Like, <laughs> no, it's gotta be you know, type A. Seventy six right? yeah. has to go before seventy seven. Yeah. Like I get it. I totally get it. And for some people, it's very hard to break away from that. So as beginning scrapbookers, you there's no rule about scrapbooking chronologically. If that's your jam and you want to do that, I'm not, you know, trying to say mm-hmm. not to scrapbook chronologically because that's how I started. Um, but there's a we have a lot of life to live and a yeah. lot of things going on. So if you get stuck scrapbooking chronologically, you run the risk of forgetting what's currently happening now, those True. current stories when you're worried about what happened in 72. Um, I'm saying 72 like I was around in 72. It's I was very not. specific. You like <laughs> just want to scrapbook the 70s. I'm an I love 80s it. kid. I was born in 81. I'm like, like what I don't even know what happened in 72. <laughs> My brother did. My mom did. Me, not so much. Um, but point being, what happened years ago or even months ago, um, there's some things that I just don't recall that happened 10 years ago. I mean, there's a lot of things that happen. So I stop being committed to scrapbooking chronologically and start focusing on scrapbooking when I feel like I'm getting behind because mm-hmm. that's a thing, right? Mm-hmm. We, well, it's not really a thing. It's, it's I think it's internal for yeah. us, mm-hmm. right, as scrapbookers. But if I feel that I have a lot of projects that were that are incomplete, I start with the most current because I say, well, at least I know what happened last month versus what happened in 2000, because right. that's been a long time ago. Um, it doesn't seem like it has, but it, it actually has been a yeah. long time ago, right? Um, and then I kind of taken on this approach where I'm working on something current, mm-hmm. but then I'll grab a project from maybe 10 years ago or something. So if I'm working on stories for January, then I'll hop back to say maybe, or January 2022, mm-hmm. then I'll drop, I'll hop back to like maybe say January 2016. Oh, okay. And then I'll scrapbook some stories there 
And then at least I'm working in the present and in the past. So I don't feel like I'm leaving behind those older stories. I'm working on them while I'm also working on the current stuff. So I'm staying updated on my current, but I'm also focusing on my past stories. Interesting. So you can kind of double dip that way as well. But I, I, for any new scrapbooker, don't feel like you have to lock yourself into a chronological process, especially if it doesn't feel natural Mm -hmm. for you. There's some scrapbookers that just scrapbook whatever they feel like scrapbooking. They Mm -hmm. don't worry about when those stories appear in the timeline and their layout and their their albums appear that way, mm-hmm. they don't care. And there's some people who do, but you find your way um, as you're kind of experimenting and figuring out figuring out your flow. But don't feel like you have to lock yourself okay. into that at all. All right, that's yeah. good. And then um, just in general, I mean, even talking about scrapbooking chronologically, it just starts mm-hmm. to sound overwhelming. So, in general, what advice do you have for people that? Or like, I'm just overwhelmed. I feel overwhelmed, Mm -hmm. but I want a scrapbook, but I feel overwhelmed. Sure. That can happen easily, particularly um, when you're taking lots of photos and you have this whole list of stories you want to tell. I always say start with the current. Start with this month. Start with this week. Mm -hmm. What happened this week that you want a scrapbook? Or what story can you pinpoint that is really important that, again, if you were never to scrapbook again, what would that story you need, you want to tell mm-hmm. that's occurred maybe within the past 30 days or mm-hmm. whatnot and start there. Print your photos, get your materials together, make the page. It's that, as you know, I'm talking to grad school Victoria at this point, <laughs> just outline the paper and <laughs> just <laughs> start, right? So pick a story. It could be something as simple as an everyday story that you put in a pocket page. It could be a 12 by 12 spread that you make about yourself. Um, maybe you went on a trip recently, or maybe there's something you found interesting mm-hmm. that you want to put into your scrapbook that deserves space in your scrapbook story. Start there, because I find that if you don't start, you're going to be stuck in creative paralysis forever and ever and ever. Mm-hmm. So just pick a starting point. Sometimes a starting point isn't always necessarily making the page. Okay, It could be the... the um, the actions that lead up to making the page. So maybe you need to spend some time with your photos. And maybe the first point is, I'm going to organize my photos from the past week. Like, don't think about the last month. Just think about this week, right? Keep it real simple. And then once you have those photos organized, and as you're organizing them, think about the stories you might want to tell from those those photos, make you a little list. Okay. And then once you're done, why not make some little kits, right? Pull your papers, mm-hmm. pull your stickers, things that you feel would go well mm-hmm. with those photos you selected. Make your little kit, set it aside. Then the next day, sit down, cup of tea, cup of coffee, yeah. sit down, make your layout. And then you just repeat the process. Yeah, prep work, is, prep just work is, is fun. Absolutely. And it can help, particularly when you're stuck or you don't know where to start. I think when you're, it's kind of like, and I'm going to use exercise as an analogy, like I ex- I've been exercising for a million years. I just start picking the habit back up. So I feel Do really it. proud of myself. I want to hear this. So one of the things that's repeated to me over and over and over again is that if on the days that you don't feel like getting up and uh-huh. working out, just do a warm up. Like okay, start for 10 it. minutes and then see how you feel after that. And I kid you not, every time that I've done that, I'm like, well, I can do another 30 minutes. Yeah. I can do another Once 20 minutes. Once you're warm, you're like, I can do it. I can do it. And then guess what? No one ever says, gosh, I regret doing that workout. No, no one ever says that. No one says that. And so anytime that I have committed to at least doing 10 minutes of a little warm up, And then eventually eases into another 20 minutes. So at that point, I've gotten a 30-minute workout. Mm. At the end, I'm like, yeah, I crushed that. That's great. I don't even know why I didn't do that. And the same with our creative pursuits. Just start somewhere. Print the photos. Spend Mm -hmm. some time with that. Get the material. Spend a little time with that. And then sit down and just have some fun making a layout. Don't put the pressure on yourself. Just open yourself up to have some fun. And once you get started, it starts building the momentum. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, well, what else can I scrapbook? Exactly. And then then hopefully you'll be inspired to start working on some other projects. Yeah, I watched your Instagram story of your Mm -hmm. trip here. Yeah. And and you love coffee. I do. And, you know, just thinking about... um, your like the name of the type of coffee that you like mm-hmm. and how much it costs today in mm-hmm. 2022. I mean, those time capsule moments that looking back 10 years or 20 years from now, I'm like, oh my gosh, it was, that's cheap. Absolutely. It really, really, it's <laughs> an arm and a leg. <laughs> exactly. Um, yes. Those are fascinating to me. They I love are. historical yes. documentation. Those are all details I like to add into my stories. And even as I, you know, having this experience of being here, which has been fabulous, um, it's been a couple of years since I've been on a business trip. And so yeah. when I go back to document this, it's like, okay, well, how was this different from, yes. you know, before the world imploded? Yeah. And how was this different from when I used to travel as a human, uh, human resources professional? 
professional mm-hmm. or and I didn't do a lot of travel when I was in um, in the child welfare field. Mm-hmm. But how is this different now? And I'm in a different career. Yeah. I'm doing different things mm-hmm. um, or, you know, even traveling wearing a mask totally. or, you know, all of these different uh-huh. things. I have all this really rich story fodder that I can now lean on. Mm -hmm. And when I'm saying, well, what can I document about this? Well, Victoria, you got like a list of 10,000 things you can document about this one experience. So I have some places I can start when I sit down to document this. Like a then now and a T-chart even, or like of how it's different, how it's the same. How are you different? Like so fascinating. Yeah. So we know that another reason why people get overwhelmed Mm -hmm. is the organization problem. It's important to remain organized And, you know, people feel like they lose stuff or they don't know what they have or they don't have the exact supplies they see. What do you think about supplies and organization? I think for beginner scrapbookers, I want those of you out there who are new, you do not need all the things. Don't let anybody let, tell you that you need all the things. Now, do we eventually buy all the things? Yes, because that's how we roll. Yeah. In this community, of course we do. So I'm fun. the biggest enabler of them all. Those who have been with me for a while know this. Um, You're like, I will enable you. I will enable I you. Promise. Exactly. Come join the Victoria Marie community. Yeah. I'll have you stocked and ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're first starting out, it's really paper some a cutting tool of some sort, scissors, your photos, a few little embellishments, maybe some stickers for a title, and you're good to go. Okay. Um, as you are gaining in your scrapbooking skills and learning new techniques and stuff, then you can introduce some other products and kind of fill, you know, kind of fill that out. But as far as organization is concerned, um, I, and I think particularly for beginner scrapbookers, find something, a, a uh, box or yes. some type of organizational tool, which scrapbook.com has plenty of the organizational tools that you need. Plug, plug. Um, <laughs> ding! <laughs> ding! <laughs> um, you can figure, as you're learning the different tools and materials, then let let the organizational piece of that come along with you so you can, you know, figure out how you want to store the things and easily access it so that you can, mm-hmm. you know, participate in your scrapbooking hobby versus just tucking it away and forgetting about it. So yes. very simple, basic tools. You don't need a whole lot um, when you're first starting out as you're learning more skills, then add a little bit more, try some different products as you're learning new techniques and then go from there. And before you know it, you'll have a big full scrapbook room of supplies. It, it is true. It balloons. It yeah. just, it, I mean, you just, it just, I don't know where it's all my so stuff fun. came from. I have no clue where it all it's came so from. so fun. <laughs> so you, we talked about this in the beginning, in the intro, you are a, you've done many scrapbook classes. Mm-hmm. What do you tell people if they're on the fence about a class or should I take a class or I don't think I need a class? Mm-hmm. What do you what do you say? I think classes are fabulous. I have taken many, many a classes, not only just for scrapbooking, but other um, hobbies as well mm-hmm. that I do. I'm learning how to embroider. So I'm taking, a, you know, I'm watching a lot of YouTube content on okay. that, but I have taken a class. Um, classes can be an invaluable source of information for um, someone who's just starting out or even as someone like me who's been doing this thing for a long time. I'm always learning something new. Um, so my thing is, is find a class that is featuring or will teach you how to do something you've, you're interested in learning. So if you want to learn how to layer, um, you can take my layering like a boss class. Um, ding! ding. <laughs> um, if you're interested in learning how to, you know, do titles, if you're, I mean, whatever it is that you're interested in, find a class that will help you learn that skill. I'm always attracted to classes that have a good balance of the, uh, the explaining the content and the technique, but also showing me, because I'm a highly visual learner, showing me how to do mm-hmm. the thing. So the embroidery classes, for instance, that I that I take, I appreciate when the instructor is actually drilling down how to do the different stitches and stuff, because mm. sometimes the names don't always right. jive like, in my show head. Me. Show me how to do this. So topic focus based on what you're interested in. Um, looking at ratings of classes, depending on the platform where the class is offered. Sometimes if someone's offering a free class on YouTube, then you may not see a rating for that, but Mm -hmm. well, except thumbs up maybe. But on a class platform or something like that, that may offer a feature where you get to see a class rating, see what people are saying about the class. um, If it's been helpful for them, if they were able to learn something from it. Um, And that is a good value. And by value, I don't necessarily mean price mm-hmm. because some classes, I, I feel that, you know, classes should be priced accordingly, okay. um, but it's going to offer a good value. What do you get out of that class? What are you going to ultimately learn or take from that course that you can then apply to what it is that you want to do? How do you think that once the class is done, because maybe you're not scrapbooking along with the class, how do, how do you keep that momentum going? Mm-hmm. So you didn't just I just took a class. Nothing exactly. To show for it. So once you take the class, take all the tools and the techniques that you learned in the class and actually start 
using them. And what happens, I hear this all the time, and particularly as someone who makes classes, Mm -hmm. is I'll have a student who will say, Victoria, I've bought like all your classes, but I haven't finished them. I'm like, I know you haven't finished them. (laughs) I see the analytics. I know. Um, (laughs) Eventually you will. Um, So I say, once you, before you move on to any other class, Uh take what you've learned from that class, maybe two or three little nuggets from Mm -hmm. that class, and then apply that technique or as you're going through the class depending on the class structure Mm -hmm. is play along with the instructor get out the materials and things that you need and play along and start practicing it because you'll be more bought into the class versus just taking it and then waiting for some people their learning style is they have to they have to absorb all the information consume the information and then they're ready to make which Mm -hmm. I completely understand Mm -hmm. that so if that's how you learn then maybe have some projects in mind that you can then work on using the techniques that you learned and immediately put those to good use. I like that idea. Be thinking of what you're going to use. Like, yeah, be thinking of some projects while mm-hmm. you're watching the class. So it's almost like you're like playing along in your mind. Absolutely. Oh, I like that. That's Absolutely. A, that's a good. Yeah. So there's also the community aspect of feeling a part of something with that teacher. And mm-hmm. I know that um, you are, you have a wonderful crafting group on mm-hmm. Facebook. So tell us a little bit about that and, yeah. and why that's important to scrapbooking. Absolutely. So I've had the Victoria Maria call my scrap boss community since nice. 2014 when I started out as a new YouTuber. YouTube channel came first and then the Facebook group. Okay. And they've been with, I've had many, many of them who've been with me since that time. So wow. they knew me when I was making cringy videos on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> Those little basic videos. And since then, that the community has grown. I'm a big, big believer in that this community should be open to everybody, um, that it should be a place where where people find it to be a creative respite, Mm -hmm. that they find friends, they're able to connect. And over the past couple of years, I, I think it really solidified in me how deeply important those connections are in a time where we were disconnected, both a lot physically because we all couldn't get together. And um, so those, the online communities, especially at least in my experience, became invaluable for a lot of my community members and just, you know, me being a part of the community in general, not just a part of my own Mm -hmm. Facebook community, but just others. Mm -hmm. Um, I have met some fantastic people who are just sweet and fabulous and creative and talented and who pour their energies into the community and are so open and welcome. One of the things I want to just a nod to the Victoria Marie community is mm-hmm. that um, I've never had any drama issue wow. in my online community, not once. Um, and I'm very, very protective of my community, not like in a weird cult way. Like I don't want people coming. I'm like, Victoria has a cult. <laughs> not I've that. I've seen that group. <laughs> not that. It's like, oh, that's that cr- the little cult that enables each other that we do do. Yeah. Yes, um, as promised. We do. We will enable you. But I want people to feel that they belong. And I think there are some segments in our community where folks may not always feel that and that it may be a little bit more closed mm, and not clicky. as open, a little clicky, yeah. you know, that type of thing. And I've never wanted that for mm-hmm. my community. So I can genuinely say that we have not had that experience in my community. Wow. We keep it very light. We have a lot of fun. People are open to share or observe because I have many people who've been with me for a long time that they've not shared not one layout, but they just like hanging out because it's, you know, it. it's not, it's a, it's a place where they enjoy being right. and they play in other communities as well, which I think is important. Um, but that connection and, and being able to share this love of scrapbooking for a lot of folks, this may be their only source of connecting with other individuals. And that becomes super important. Mm, yeah. um, or people who don't have friends that scrapbook or, yeah. you know, or that's just not supported. Or maybe mm-hmm. it is, but it's just not that person's jam. And that's cool. But they know that they can come to whether it's my community or other mm-hmm. communities um, and be a part of storytelling and mm-hmm. be a part of this you know, buying stuff yeah. and us enabling each other and having fun. And and then hopefully, you know, as things kind of change a little bit and ease up, then maybe we can get back to in-person yes, things. Yes, meetups. Um, a yeah. lot of, I remember one of my my croppers, uh, she came to my 
scrapbook retreat, I think it was the very first one. And at that point, the the only communication we've had, most of all my guests there were via Facebook when okay. I hosted my first retreat years ago. Mm-hmm. And her husband was like, so you're going to drive all the way to Texas to go to this retreat <laughs> to be with someone you've See? only known on Sounds Facebook? Like She's a like, cult. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so she loaded up the car and she drove down and we've been buddies ever since. I love it. And so I think that's that's the value of the community is that is that connection. Yeah. And for me, not only connection, but it's a welcoming spot for everybody. I believe strongly in inclusion for sure. Yeah, that's so special that it was already so dedicated and established before Mm -hmm. everything changed because I think it probably was a respite, a a special place for so many people. It Mm -hmm. sounds like you're just like a mama bear and you're just very, (laughs) you know, you want it to be that safe, wonderful place for people. I do, I do. And I I do the same at my, I haven't hosted it in person before 2020, but even with my uh, my I host virtual crops okay. every month and we have um, Zoom scrap and chat sessions. And so we scrap and chat and talk and yeah. all those good things. And at the end of it, I mean, if you're new to it, then you've had like, you've met a hundred new people that you can connect with. Is we just talk like we've just all been friends for mm-hmm. years and years. And so the la- the first one we had this year, well, I, the first one I had in 2020, but this year's crop that we had a couple, few weeks ago, uh, we had some newbies that came in. They're like, oh, it felt really comfortable. It just felt really natural. I'm like, yes, this is what I want. This is yeah. what I work so hard for is for people. I just want, I just want to step back and just let, let people do their thing, mm-hmm. right? I bring you together and just y'all mm-hmm. connect and because it's a beautiful beautiful thing when you it happens well. It. Absolutely. You create the space and then step back and let them just and enjoy them do each thing. other. Absolutely. Nice. Yeah. You have shared some really, really great tips, tricks, points, some good pointers, some good advice even for me. I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, I didn't think about that before. <laughs> I haven't done this for a long time. So yeah. thank you. True. We can't end without asking you the question I love to ask everyone. Mm-hmm. What is the most meaningful handmade project that you have ever created? So to date, I would have to say one is my wedding album. Okay. And the other is my daughter's baby album. And those, they kind of seem like cliche albums or cliche responses. (laughs) The wedding album specifically, uh, because um, my spouse and I have been married for... How long have we been married? 14 years. She's going to laugh. Awesome. Which years. Congrats. At the time, my spouse was a he, not mm-hmm. a she. Okay. And uh, my spouse is transgender, male to female. And so that album now serves as sort of a capstone yeah. of our relationship and how um, not only her transition, and I do refer to her as my wife yes. and not my husband, okay. but how her, what her transition was, how we were then, mm-hmm. and where we are at now. So I'm working on, well, really in my head, I haven't actually started physically working on this, an album of who we are now. Okay. Going into almost 15 years wow. of marriage. You kind of lose count after a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how many like, years is that? Um, less <laughs> than rough, 20, more than 10. Right, yeah. exactly. Somewhere in that range. And so it's going to be interesting when I'm working on that album just to kind of compare yeah. where we were then as, gosh, she was in, she was working on a PhD. I was working on a, I was working in as a human resources manager. Yeah. Um, what our family dynamics were, because the family dynamics have changed mm-hmm. for a lot of reasons since that time. And where we're at now. Yeah. And the fact that we're, we're still together. And yeah. what did we learn through Your this parents, this project? We're parents. You do we're, different things. Absolutely. Absolutely. She's a college professor now. I own a business now. Right. We've got an almost 12-year-old daughter, which, you know, go dig a hole and cry because, yeah. you know, 12. Um, and we've had a lot of things happen. So it's going to be interesting to look at that. But that is just such a capstone of where we started. And then, of course, the baby album, because she's my one and only. We only yeah. planned on having one kid. And she's I'm not just saying this because she's my kid, but she's spectacular. And I just love her. her name is Corinne and my wife's name is Aubrey. But Corinne is just a fabulous kid. Mm-hmm. And we always said if we had another one, it would probably come out just horrible. So you we're just stop here. You just <laughs> we'll just stop yeah. here. But I remember just I like looking back on that. And I'm saying that as if it's finished because it's not. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's an okay. unfinished album, but I look on the pages that I do have done. And um and look how teeny she was. She was yeah. only like five pounds, 14 oh. ounces. She was so little. Yeah. And um, remember the doctor placing her in my arms or the nurse placing her in my arms mm-hmm. and she popped her eyes open and I'm just cry, cry, cry. And to look at her ages and stages, it, just that first year of just dynamic growth and development at that so age. Much. And um, 
now it just seems like so long ago now that she's mm-hmm. going to be 12 and she's solidly in the preteen mm-hmm. years and you know mom I love you mom you're sus you know uh-huh, you know it's just uh-huh. it's a totally different dynamic so if if you know something ever happened I could care less about any other scrapbook I made those are the two if I had to flee an emergency or whatnot then those would be the two that I would grab for those, those reasons wow yeah I love that and yeah I don't I don't yeah are they stereotypical? Sure, the wedding, the baby sure. album, but your stories about them yeah, aren't. They and are not, yeah. That's you and who you are and who your beautiful family is. Absolutely. I love it. 